Peace, peace. Greetings to you all. It's your brother Naheem, BKA Lord Abba, aka Mr. Just the Facts. Uh, tonight, the Be the Power team, we're going to have a powerful discussion tonight. We got the iconic hip hop legend in the building on the panel joining our discussion tonight, brother Chubb Rock. Um, first, I want to say it's an honor to have you on, brother, and you know, we're just going to have a powerful, powerful build. Family, click the like button. Uh, share the video. Let people know that we are having a discussion because at the end of the day, as we push for reparations for our people, as we push for a political agenda that helps all of our people, what, what's called the Black agenda, we're going to need everybody on board and if there's any differences of opinions etc cetera, etc cetera, then we need to have these types of conversations on on everything so that we could begin the hash and out process i'm not gonna take too much time man i'm i'm excited i'm i'm gonna bring the panel on we got my brother uh ali in the building we got my brother dr logic in the building my brother josh is in the building and we got the incomparable Hip hop iconic legend Chub Rock in the building. Peace, family. Yes. How you doing? How are you? The brothers doing out there? We good. We good. We good. Glad to have you on. We well, look. We, this is how we going to do it. I will say this, um, uh, brother Ali. Uh, Ali and I go back, brother. You call him Rock. <laughs> we go back about I want to say ten years now, and I've I've met this brother through another Moorish group that we were both a part of. And after we left that group, the brother just, I don't know, he sent some information to my inbox one day and we've been connected ever since. And it was probably two years before this brother ever told me that he knew somebody in the music industry. I remember him sending me a link to some of the, uh, things that he, he produced and the records, et cetera. And I was like, hmm. I, I didn't know. I'm like, Wait, why, why, why you never told me about any of this, right? So it was it was great, man. I was like, all right, this brother is humble. <laughs> this brother is humble and we just, I, we just vibed. I was honored to meet the brother a couple of times. I actually was listening when I believe it was the Trayvon Martin death when y'all were on the radio talking about that when you were still on the radio in New York, Chubb. I believe that yeah. was the Trayvon Martin. Death. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna let my brother Ali come in and start the process. Y'all can get into how y'all know each other, and then we just go into the discussion. Peach. Well, the, here's the thing, man. Uh, I don't even. We know each other so long. I don't even remember how we met. To be honest yeah, with you, it is, it's it's a good set of set of decades there. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, but, very um, long. More than more than likely, it has some connection to my brother, my brothers in Houdini, uh, and Jalil, and Doc Ice. Ice. You know what I mean? Shout out to Jalil, X, Doc Ice. Those all those all those brothers is my family. Just like Chuck is my family. You know, yeah. like we all go back a long, long way. And so, um. You know, I'm assuming it was probably through that some kind of way. You know what I mean? Um, so Chubb and I, um, myself being a musician and a producer, we worked we worked on music together and everything like that. And when, like you said, when Chubb was on the radio, WBLS in New York City, well, in the yeah. tri-state really, is a tri-state mm -hmm. um, situation. I used to be on, a, you know, sometimes I would go up there with him and stuff like that and we would you know chop it up every now and then about different things sometimes we get into some political social political stuff or whatever so that was really my extent of uh, involvement with uh, his radio show in new york um but uh so he since has moved to atlanta yeah he's popping off down there and so you could you could break it down chubb in terms of uh your radio show in atlanta and everything like that yeah we have a um a syndicated morning show now mm -hmm. so we're we're on in atlanta we're on in oklahoma city we're on in lawton oklahoma we're on in augusta georgia we're on in um Com columbia south carolina we're on you know we're on some various stations 
And, um, you know, we're out there trying to make sure that people have certain information. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a news network anymore. And, and, um, you know, the one consistency that is still there and you hope that it will stay there will be black radio. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up with, you know, Frankie Crocker and Hal Jackson and Mm -hmm. right. Mr. Magic and, you know, the great Bob Slade and, Oh yeah. uh, You know, that vibe M2 may and, Yes. Open line on Sunday, and you know, Shout I, out to, to me. Yeah, I grew up on that level, so you know, I always felt, well, if I'm down here, let me try to bring that here. Let me bring some of that vibe here. So you know, at the end of the day, you know, I love it. I like what I do, but um, information is really the key. How do we put out information? How do we keep learning? Um. And then, you know, research. That's the thing about, uh, I mean, I call him C, right? But you guys call him <laughs> Ali Bay. He's a researcher. You know, he's a researcher. And we've had oh, yeah. conversations, oh, yeah. conversations about various things, and it's all about research, right? How we research the the scenarios and things of that nature. So when he told me told me about the, uh, you know, the, the podcast, um, Be the Power, I was like, oh, brother, you don't have to ask me more than once about that one. <laughs> let's go have the conversation and you know figure out the information and and learn and maybe we can learn from each other and um but it's a it's an interesting time so <laughs> they they ain't no other time but now i don't think there will ever be another time in history than now yeah that's there's the never been another time but now that's a fact <laughs> how 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 is to say the perpetual now right the perpetual mm-hmm. now the never yeah. ending now <laughs> yeah, this is it, man. There's, there's no, there, there will never be another time like this. Facts. It's a very unique time. Um, you, you see it even from just watching after what happened with George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor. You see, even white America has been touched, particularly the youth, particularly the youth of white America. They've been touched and they've been moved by the circumstances and. Um, I think we, and like you're saying, this is a very unique time, and I think it's a great time to really try to make the country into a reparationist country. You know, I think that's that's really our goal at this point in time is to try to get as many people on board and to understand the necessity at this point for this type of change that needs to happen in this country. Let me tell you, you know, when you talk about reparations. I think people get reparations somewhat misconstrued. They think it's this dollar amount, right? Hey, man, we need we need seven hundred and eighty billion. The reality to it is, you can never put a number to make up for slavery, to make up for castrations and, and lynchings and being Burn. burned alive and yeah. You never put a, you never could put a price on it. So when you're dealing with reparation, you're dealing with a certain situation, right? Now, and I think it isn't just some dollar amount, but it's a it's a certain change in a system for the reparations. Now th- that change could include some financial things, right? Hey, we don't want to pay taxes ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just like, yeah. You ever seen this movie called Armageddon? Yeah, I, I oh, think yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah with um Bruce they, Willis and they said, mm-hmm. Hey man, what, what do we have to give you to go to the moon? Okay, mm-hmm. and, and drill holes. The guy said, Oh, we don't want to pay none of us want to pay taxes ever. <laughs> right? So there's all kinds of things, and it isn't far fetched either because native Indians, native Indians, they don't have to pay taxes. Right. Right. So, I mean, there's there's all kinds of constructions of reparations, because if it isn't if it's just about a dollar amount, trust me, that will never do it. And it, it isn't like what people will think. You know, I think I think about Apple. Apple just lost the lawsuit where. For their iPhone users, they got to they got to pay out like five hundred billion dollars. Right. 
right. or whatever the number was. It was some ridiculous amount of money. It comes up to $25 a per, for an iPhone user per iPhone. This big number. Yeah. So, so it isn't about some number, but it's about a certain dedication to Africans for the for the for the entire lifespan of every generation. Let me um can I step in and slide right on in at this particular time? Um you said some very interesting things, Chubb. So one thing that um we as reparationists and trying to you know gain national support for what needs to be done, right? We are trying to educate people on what a pure reparations program is and what it actually looks like. So I agree with you in one instance and I, and I disagree with you in another. One is no, you can't put a number on the pain and the suffering. That's that You can't put a number on that. But what we can do is come up with a real figure on the 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 actual financial loss that we took during during chattel slavery through lost wages uh with the apps the the worth of our actual bodies as we built and were used as the actual currency of america and that we were our actual bone and body was worth more than all of american industry combined so we we can put dollar amounts on certain things we may not be able to put dollar amounts on the value of human life and blood and castrations and lynching and whatnot, but we can put uh, life on things that actually had monetary value. And so when we talk about rep a pure reparations program, we want it to be centered around closing the racial wealth gap because mm. the racial wealth gap started when, when the government emancipated 4 million black people, right? into poverty, 4 million black people into homelessness, 4 million black people into joblessness, right? So when even when we went and pursued a job and someone was kind enough to hire us, they had to live under the threat of being killed for even paying us a decent wage. So we then they legislated pain and suffering into our everyday existence. So that's why our specific claim is with the United States government for being complicit in sanctioning the most horrific kind of laws and practices and institutions that we know in our life. And we know slavery is a global thing, but we, we what we're trying to do now is come to a certain place in American history where we can bring about acknowledgement, redress, and closure for what America did to a specific people here in this country, in this government. So, and then we can talk about things beyond that. But when we talk about the financial number and the economics of it, I think we're we'll centered around the lost promise of a, the 40 acres and a mule, which came from General Stanton and uh, Field Order 15, and also had the backing of the United States Congress with that thing, and how Reconstruction was overthrown and how Andrew Johnson was a criminal, I think we have a real case for some specific, real, hard numbers. And okay. so that's right. why I, I, I got to say something. Okay, so the reason why I think you'll never come up with the right numbers is because of this. And I'm, I'm going to break it down in a couple of different manners. I, I remember reading a story. There was a, a gentleman, right? And they wrongfully convicted him, and he went and spent 26 years in jail. He didn't do it, right? It happened upstate New York in somewhere in Poughkeepsie area. They found out once DNA came that he never he did not rape this white lady. And finally, they found out that it was a white man who raped this white lady. And so they said, okay, we got to come up with a number. And then they calculated, okay, well, we took 26 years of his life and this is the average pay of people with his level of education and this and boom and boom. Okay, so we owe him a million and six dollars. And I took offense to it because I'm like, wait, 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 wait. You, you ga you're gauging it on what you believe is a number of his level of education, which you derailed because he was in jail for 26 years. So you have no idea what he would have been. Because I could say 
make an argument, well, he was going to be Bill Gates. Oh, he was going to be the guy that created Amazon. So how you can put a number on what you think he could be and not be. So it's an impossible number, right? So the main thing is not that it isn't deserving. You can never get to that number. So you're going to have to get to the deserving of a certain system. You know, what is it that you're really going to get? Maybe African-Americans are going to have their own political system. They're not going to be part of your system. Maybe they're going to be able to only be policed by a police of their choosing, not your. I mean, there got to be something that systematically will last forever while a black person is on the planet. It can't be a number because the number is infinite. Let me let me jump in real quick just to say this, right? One of the one of the things that economists like uh, Dr. William Sandy Darity, um, shout out to him and his wife, Kirsten Mullins. They wrote the book From Here to Equality. One, one of the things that these social economists are doing is they are taking the promise of the 40 acres and the mule and they are making the calculations with the necessary compounded interest that would show from the time that if we had gotten our 40 acres and a mule that we would have been able to pass along generational mm -hmm. wealth, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, 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 I hear your analogy, and th this is why we're having this discussion. I believe that this is a good roundabout discussion to have. But in in not giving us the 40 acres and, and the mule, it created what we call the, the racial wealth gap. It's more like a, a chasm, right? It's, it, it, it's almost bottomless at this point, there's some numbers that, that we can pull up to show the actual difference between median household wealth for whites and median household wealth for blacks. And even when we get down into the lower percentiles of black and white people, the differences are still great. But the problem with us is we're beyond the decimal point, right? We're in the negative area. So it's imperative that a whole reparations program and and you know we we try not to on this show focus it strictly around money but <clears throat> to live in the united states of america we have to afford to live here because if we can't that's going to lead to crime and mental illness and and the sufferings that we have been dealing with for the past 300 and something odd years right so the monetary aspect of it that has to happen in a broader reparations package, one of the things that will be done is that we don't need to create a new system. We just need to get the kinks out of the system that we already have now. If you have racists who are writing legislation that ill affects our people and puts them in a position of, of superiority perpetually, when the system when we look at the United States Constitution, wasn't designed for that, and we know that these are just the whims of men, then what we need is we need to gather ourselves politically so that we can start the process of changing what's going on in the system. So, you know, I just wanted to address that that aspect of, of what you were saying. I don't think we need a I separate need, police need. force yeah, I don't think we need a separate police force. I just think we need to really reform the police force that we have and let them know that if y'all do anything to anybody outside the purview of the law, you will be treated as any other criminal would be. And that's how you fix the system. You uh, eliminate qualified immunity and the, and the protections that not only police officers have, but that malicious prosecutors prosecutors have. Uh, mm -hmm. racist judges, et cetera, et cetera. These issues have to be a part of a broader reparations package. Because because they're all linked. And to the to the point about the police, I do think that police should be members of the community. A lot of, you know, in Harlem, a lot of the police that are in Harlem uh, are European Americans who don't live in Harlem. They're usually coming from the suburbs someplace into Harlem. So they really have no connection to the people in the community. 
You know, I mean, Chubb, you know, uh, Naheem, you know, we, we are from New York. So, you know, a lot of those Europeans that working in those police departments, they don't live in our communities. See, the thing yeah. with, you see, when you think about, it might sound far-fetched to you when I said something about a separate police force, but it it happens. Mormons have their own police department. They have their own policing. They, they, they're not they're not bound by Utah's police or some other, you know, wherever you see them. You, um, uh, uh, Amish have their own system. They're not bound by any system by Pennsylvania. You can't even go on their line. I mean, you can't do it. So it isn't a far-fetched thing. I'm not no, talking about something that doesn't it, exist. No, it's not a far-fetched thing. But let, let's frame it this way. I want to I want to start with what you just said and then work backwards, right? The Mormons didn't build America. We did. We need America that works for us, right? The Mormons are a small group that live in isolated places in this country. We we built the entire country and made it an economic superpower. So exactly. we we That's deserve why. we no, deserve. No, you're you're hundred percent right. So why in the world? Let, let me just all the faction have that, but a bigger right. faction that built the country can't have that. But we we can have it. Let me just let me let me explain, Sabi, because the Mormons didn't did not ex. Before I get to the Mormons, let me just continue with what I was saying. The Amish also didn't build America. And th so they have been made white in America. We were, we were never made white in America. So America is a place that was rooted in racism. So even though the, the Amish and the, uh, the, the uh, Mennonites and also the, uh, the Mormons, they have their specific histories in this country right and they, they love different things as well they don't have our story so what we're saying is right although there is no number you can put on the pain and suffering i'm not going to stop you from pain i'm not going to stop you from paying because mm -hmm. i know that there's no amount you can continue to pay and continue to pay i'm not going to stop you from paying because so i'm not going to say I'm not going to accept no money because there's no amount of money you can pay me. If you think a trillion, 14 and 15 and 21 trillion dollars, we going let, let, let's work with that and then we'll continue to talk. Okay, I maybe, I said it, maybe I said it wrong. Uh, not, no, I didn't say it wrong. Let me explain it to a different way. When I meant something that is permanent, it's a permanent reparation. Money is not a permanent reparation. No, it's not. Because you could say, oh, okay, I need. 35 zeros in it and they pay that then they say oh so you got paid now so everything is over no good, so good point. There's, good there's, point. A, there's a there's a yeah. there's a continuation yes of meaning the kennedys anytime you crack the liquor seal he got paid he'd been dead 80 years it, it papa joe papa kennedy but it's a it's a forever thing Right. So what I mean, reparation, I'm talking about the reparation going to be something that is put in a system forever. Yeah. Okay. So, so Chubb, that, check this out. Right. Check it out. Right. So that we're I'm with you on that particular point. That's what we're talking about. And oftentimes, people are just talking about some check that arrives in their account or right. in the mailbox, right. or some liquid. We're, we're talking about a pure reparations program that is funded by the United States government that is made to have generational effects, long lasting, forever lasting effects. Of course, we can come up with a reparations program that's poorly put together and it'll have lousy effects. That can happen. But that's not what we're fighting for. We're fighting for a reparations program that is going to be specific enough, comprehensive enough and have the long lasting effects so that we can really and truly bring about closure to the situation. So of course, ha uh, issuing, having the Fed issue some liquid to us will not do that. We're talking about a complete program of, that will, of restoration and repair. So we're talking about land loss, we're talking about land restoration. We are talking about uh, capital loss, we're talking about capital restoration we're talking about being we're, it's not only for chattel slavery and the things that come with chattel slavery like not being able to earn wages being the value of the american system not being able to own property and being recognized as a human being and have regular human decency that not just that but after we was emancipated all of the legislative suffering, pain, and failure that was legally legislated into our lives. So we're talking about the Black Code. 
We're talking about addressing Jim Crow. We're talking about convict leasing. So we're talking about a program that is structured to repair all of that. So I agree with you when you say money won't just giving out currency, issuing out currency won't do that. But if we come up with a program, and when I say a program, I'm not talking about the Urban League or something like that. I'm talking about real programs that are funded by the United States Treasury, like Social Security, like Medicaid, like public aid. These are programs that are that that are funded by the United States government. And you ain't getting rid of those programs. Those programs ain't going nowhere. And what I'm saying is. This is what me, Naheem, Ali and our brother Josh and many other um, uh, uh, ADOSers and reparationists around the world are actually talking about because there have been the people who are against us are making it seem like we just want some check in the mail and then everything's going to be over. That's not what reparations is about. Reparations really is coming up with no, everything, your, your passion and everything is totally incredible because I love that. But here's the I'm 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 I like when I use the English language, there's, there's certain things that I, I don't never want to get construed. And you use the word a couple of times in, in your rundown. And your word that you use was repair. Mm -hmm. There is no repairing it. You cannot repair what happened to the millions of Africans. There's no repairing that. Okay. If I if I was abused over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and then at some point the abuse stops, and then you fill that person or that animal, anything, with love, extreme love, it doesn't repair that kind of brutality. So there is no there got to be some some understandings of certain things, no matter what the system is. And go for the system, go for the reparation system. It's 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 needed. It's deserved. It's over deserved. But I think you got you can't use certain buzzwords like, oh, this will repair this. No, let, this me, give will, oh, let, me, let me give you an example. Oh, uh, if but I don't want you to think that you can repair it. I just want to contextualize something. So the repair we're talking about is closing the racial wealth gap because that uh, uh, really kind of led to a lot of the disadvantages that we have. So when we're talking about the repair, we're not really talking about the moral and, and, and the punitive damages that come with physical harm and mental trauma and things like that. I was no, talking about that either. Oh, but but so, so, if, so if I steal 40 acres from you, that is a harm that I committed. That's damage. Right. Correct. If I tear down your business, that's damage. Right. But I can repair that because I can fund the program that will rebuild your business and restore your business to its former prominence and glory. So you can repair things like that. There is reparation. Remember, you can repair it because now you're dealing with. And, and let me and let me explain this part of it. And, 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 and this is I don't want. When I mean when the things that I'm saying is to think bigger than what I, I see it bigger than this i mean it, it's it's great but i'm so I'm, I'm going by a certain knowledge of certain not knowledge but a thought a thought process so you say 40 acres and mule because let me tell you how the trick will happen right so you come up with an idea and you say well listen man the robbery of the 40 acres and, and the mule there's there's, there's a you, you can repair that damage so we say okay the 40 acres and a mule they might come and say, okay, so what is that worth? Or where would where would the race be if they would have gotten that? And what I'm saying is, you got to come with a certain thing that, like you said, cuts down the inequality. But the reality is that I can't tell you that because I'm going to say my 40, my acres was, was, was priceless. Well, that's a personal. You, you might, you might come, you might come that's and say personal. it was worth, it was worth this. No, no, it, it, no, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't personal. It's that like, is. because there's a real market value on what your. Well, there's a real market value on what Forty Acres was worth in 1865 and 1866, and there's certain numbers called a, a, a pre and we can call compound interest. 
and we we have places. expert economists who have speculated in several different metrics what that 40 acres would be worth in two, in 2020. So in we, 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 we although you you're what you're talking about is we can't land on an exact number. What we can do is 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 give a good faith effort on getting there. And I'll take a good faith effort on getting there than not doing nothing at all. So no, no, no. if we if we it's can't give out if, if it, it could be priceless, but if you want to pay me the market value plus the compound interest, I'm going to accept that. Meaning, what I'm trying to say is this: if I gave you 40 acres in 18 whatever whatever, okay, your 40 acres in Virginia is worth different from the 40 acres in Florida, different from the 40 acres of you was in upstate New York, different from the 40 acres of you was in California, right? Where the gold rush was, right? So now you're dealing with different 40 acres. But, but you you as an enterprising gentleman, it isn't what your 40 acres is worth. It's what the 40 acres could have allowed you to get more of. So it that's isn't- true. That's true, true. yeah. That's true. So but, yeah. you realize it yeah. isn't just, what what the 40 acres was worth no it's what i could have done because i had the 40 that's acres included that's included absolutely, absolutely. that's included we're with you so, all. That's, so that's what i'm talking about i'm talking about it has to be a broad breakdown because it cannot be a finite situation let me let me say no. this it's oh, like if oh. i go to you and you're in savannah and i yeah. can tell you're a brilliant guy and i say hey bro um i heard that you like you like music, man. And I say, hey, man, here's a drum machine for you. You deserve that. Mm -hmm. Now, you could take that drum machine, and then I can give a drum machine to a different guy, and then I can give a drum machine to a young lady, and I can give a drum machine to another young lady. Now, you can make a million dollars with that drum machine. They can make 10 million. One can make a billion, and one can make nothing. But we so, can't we can't really speculate individual aspirations, right? What we're trying to do is come with hard numbers. No, 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 because no, I can put a dollar amount on that. No, stop, stop. stop, stop, we did, stop, we did, stop we did a bunch stop, of stop. Hold, on, hold on, Chuck. We can't put a dollar amount on what 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 one could have been, right? What we can do is develop a program that gives us access to the things that we were locked out of. We can create a program that gives us access to the capital that we were locked out of. We no, no, no. We're not talking about, we're we're not talking about what you could have been. See, that's why I love you guys, man, because I like what you're talking about. No, you see, not what you could have been, what you were destined to be. We came <laughs> from it already. All right, here's a scenario. Let, let's, came let's from with, you came from this already. Let, let, let's stick with the, um. what did you say, a music, a beat machine? Drum machine. Drum yeah. machine, okay. My so, analogy. Yeah. Okay, so I get a, a drum machine 300 years ago, right? And everybody else gets this drum machine. But all the people that look like me have their drum machines taken from them. And everybody else, and it's really just only two other people in the United States of America, our people, so we're going to break it down to blacks Logic and whites, happen. right? Okay, yeah. We're going to break it down to blacks and whites. So the drum machines that we got, because let's just say we live in this uh, utopia where music is the thing that's going to drive everything that we do from here on out. And so almost 400 years ago, we all get these drum machines. But the problem is that our drum machines get taken from us. And the whites that had the drum machines, well, they made beats and they were able to build this empire off of these particular drum machines that started almost 400 years ago, while the blacks had their drum machines taken from them. Now, a few of them may have gotten access to a drum machine here and there over time, but collectively, they couldn't build the same wealth as whites because they didn't have the drum machines. The drum machines got taken from them. Or let's go with another scenario. Let's just say everybody else, the whites had the drum machines, and uh, the blacks were locked out of this musical experience and, and building so that they could build generational wealth for their children. And so these uh, whites, one day they fight about, should they give us drum machines? And then they say, well, look, we're going to give you guys the drum machines. So then the head guy, and we could say Abraham Lincoln, makes the promise and he gets murdered because he wants to give the blacks drum machines. And then his replacement, the vice president comes along and, and takes all the drum machines back that were already given and 
halts the drum machines that were going to go out. So the analogy that you're giving, like I can I can reframe it and say that because we had those drum machines taken from us, we were never able to become what it is that we were destined in the richest nation in the United States of America if we're using this analogy via music, right? So, you know, I just wanted to use your analogy just to show you why this fight for reparations that, because we hear you, and this is why we wanted you on, because we wanted to have a discussion that needs to be had, because everybody has their views about reparations, right? And you, and let me tell you, I think the discussion that you guys are having is absolutely brilliant. And what I was saying when I did the analogy, and I excuse me, because we're, we're music people, <laughs> so <laughs> the musical. No, so but the, the, what I'm saying is, and you gave a good point. They got the drum machine taken away from you. Mm -hmm. So when you fought, when you fast forward 400 years, it isn't that what we need now is drum machines or even better drum machines. No, what I'm saying is we deserve to be the electricity that turns the drum machine on. Because you true. can't I turn agree. the drum machine on without electricity. So I'm talking about a different system at this point, a different system well, we, we, we talk about i don't mean to cut you we're talking about forget the drum machine at this point we lived here underneath your foot because you got rich off of those drum machines so we want the compensation matter of fact let's go further let's just say we built the drum machines and then everybody got a chance to be a part of uh, uh this you this music utopia we actually built the drum machines, let's just say we built them. And then the whites came, let's say we built them for free. And then the whites seized power and then took the drum machines from us and made sure that we never had access to any of the royalties that the drum machine produced <laughs> in the music. You see where I'm going with this? So we, we, we gotta like today, we can't look at it as, well, we just need the 40 acres now. We don't need that at the moment. We just need to partake in all of the money that America locked us out of. We need to partake in the American life because my brother Logic said on one show, he said, um, we were paying taxes, but we couldn't go eat at the, the restaurants downtown. We were paying taxes and we couldn't enjoy ourselves. I'm going to add this part in at the movie theaters because they wouldn't let us in. We were doing the things that uh, an American citizen were, was required to do while being locked out of the very American life. Yep. That's right. Life that, um, that Americans got to enjoy. So, you know, I just wanted to interject with that point. I think we're all saying the same thing. <laughs> I think we are. And, and we're going to bring those things in concert with each other because I, I feel what you're saying and that's why this conversation is so important to have and this is the conversation that a lot of people really don't want to have because if people have challenging ideas and concepts people want to just shy away from the conversation say oh this person doesn't know anything i don't want to talk to them oh my god this conversation is too hard to have so that's why we wanted to have you on and really have the discussion live so people can hear like this is the job in the in the in the responsibility and duty of a reparationist you're going to have to have these challenging complicated conversations because reparations is not some simple thing. It's a very complicated solution to a very severe and complicated problem. So what we have and, and, and if the way people carry on about it, it will be well, not going to say everybody, but the way most people or a lot of people carry on about it, it will be something that they'll be like, they can just throw some currency and some liquid at it and then it'll run through your hands and be gone. And that's what we cannot allow to happen reparations pure reparations has to be a program that has generational long lasting effects that actually closes the racial wealth gap and builds economic security and power for the people that was harmed by this institution and so some of the points that and to some of the points that chubb have raised earlier these the same things that we talk about um and you can even see some of this at the uh ados101.com website when you look at things like the black agenda or the roadmap to reparations, what you'll see is that tax exemptions, you'll see debt forgiveness, you'll see a number of things that will be included in not just getting get, getting finances or getting a check for you know individuals who are descendants of slavery, but also 
these types of things. And so to me, it's like it is a really comprehensive. It is about having a really comprehensive program the way Professor Darity is breaking it down and, and from here to equality. You know, um, it's it's a real comprehensive thing, man. And, and I think uh, I, I implore people to read that book, From Here to Equality by Professor uh, Sandy Darity and his, his, his wife, Kirsten Mullen excellent book we're, we're in the process of, of finishing that book up right now it's a lot of a lot of the things that you're concerned about um some of the things that you're raising some of the issues you're raising that stuff is in in the book and they actually address a lot of this stuff in in that particular book oh i'm sure man i mean mm -hmm. it, it is it is it, it it's it, it it should be it is well deserved it isn't far-fetched for people that think that reparations to Africans is a far-fetched thing. I don't even understand why, why why they would think that's a far-fetched situation. It's not a far-fetched situation. It's been done before. And it oh, if you go to war with a country and you lose, you got to pay for the damage to that place. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it, it isn't nothing that's new. And, and I think, yeah. Chubb, real quick, and I didn't mean to cut you, but I, I want to say we, for us, right, America's descendants of slavery, we have a specific justice claim with the United States of America. So we we can't use the term Africans, right? We got to use the term Americans because that's the government that owes us. Uh, in, in the Caribbean countries, right, you have CARICOM. And, and Ali Bey let us know that you are from, from the Caribbean. That's something that I, I never knew. And we, they have CARICOM, and CARICOM is dedicated to the uh, reparations fight for all of the islands in the Caribbean. And, and that claim has to be specific. In fact, it's in, in the name. And again, I always forget the name of what CARICOM means. The Caribbean so, community. The Caribbean community, right? Yeah. So, you know, when they're saying reparations, they're not saying necessarily Africans in that sense. They're saying these people in these specific islands that were under uh, British domination, who made that made the crown, if you will, filthy rich, while they are suffering and are poor. So, for, in America, we have to make the same claim with specificity. So we can't say Africans. We have we have to say America's descendants of slavery, so that the reparations discussion doesn't get muddled by because a politician is going to take that and he or she is going to try to say, well, you're asking for reparations for Africans. So therefore that can be anybody. There's Africans in the Caribbean. There's Africans in Brazil, yada, yada, yada. Well, we are American. You know, my ancestors was here when this country first signed the declaration of independence. So our reparations has to be specific. No, the re and you're probably right. But what I'm saying is the reason why that's, that becomes a cloudy issue because Americans were involved with the slave trade and in the Caribbean. It wasn't just England. It wasn't just the British. They Americans was involved with the Caribbean slave trade. That was a Jamaica itself was a buck breaking um, nation for them there. They created buck breaking in the Caribbean for America. So America had something to do with the Caribbean separation of those Africans. So if they can say, well, we're Americans too, because you helped destroy us too. Because it isn't just the British. Okay, so the, you, you, yeah, that was colonized by the British, but America was involved with this, the destruction there, just like the French. The, the French was involved with in Haiti, and, you know, Haiti overthrew. And, and, Let me and, say and, and you know what? That, 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 um, that is true. And but what I, I think that is a separate claim that even even every one of us would be willing to help construct and make because be, it's a difference from being, you know, a participating party in another country's uh, land and government helping do nefarious activity. And there's a difference between what you're doing to your own people that live in your own land. So our claim is specific in the case that it is with our own government. So if 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 the Jamaicans have a case with with America, if the Jamaicans have a case with Fran France and uh, Britain, 
they have a case. I'm not here to just say that they don't have a case. I, I would be willing to help them build that case. What we're saying is it's not tied in or braided in with this specific case. This specific case is for specific harms to a specific people in a specific place. Not saying that that other stuff did not happen in Jamaica. Not saying we're not denying America's participation in anything else that they did. What we're saying it is, it is a separate claim and it needs to be filed separately because it needs to be specific as well. So if you're going to talk about American participation in buck breaking in Jamaica, that needs to be uh, separated and made to uh, be attached to that claim specifically. No, I, I, and that, that, without question, I wasn't saying it was braided. I was just using why well, the reason why I was using the the, the, the large term of Africans. That, that was the real reason because yeah. I was using the term African and you said, hey, no, but I'm American. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I totally get the, the, the various separations of the cause, but I just wanted to make sure we put in there that America's had their hand in those destructions as well. Oh, yeah. Right. America yeah. had his hand in almost everything. America is, is something else. <laughs> you know, right. so you know, you have you have, you know, the Africans that ended up in Australia and I mean, Africans that ended up in Brazil. I mean, it's it was a global scenario. But I get what you're saying that the first concentration or the concentration, at least on the the uh, the reparations is dealing with America and the Americans. And it's descendants so of think slavery. about it. Think mm -hmm. about it in this sense, too, because this is one of the analogies I like to use. Um, like there may have been multiple car crashes, right? Um, but when you when when it's time for you to do an insurance claim, your insurance claim is going to be against the person who hit your car, right? We can't we can't make insurance claims against everybody who were involved in car accidents around the same time as us. We have to make a, a claim against the people who actually hit our car. And so it's the same thing here. I think that um I think that when you talk about the Caribbean community and what the United States may may have done in the Caribbean community or did actually did do in in different Caribbean nations, I think um, CARICOM is on the right track. See, see what I put up on the screen. Um, this is from CARICOM's website pertaining to their reparations um, agenda, and they say here that the Caribbean Reparations Commission, which they put together, is a regional body created to establish the moral, ethical, and legal case for the payment of reparations by the governments of all the former colonial powers and the relevant institutions of those countries to the nations and the people of the Caribbean community for the crimes against humanity of native genocide, the transatlantic slave trade, and ra a racialized system of chattel slavery. So they're being very specific. Uh, when you look at what CARICOM is doing, they're very specific when they talk about to the nations and the people of the Caribbean community. So it's not what, what they're doing. It's not a global push against white supremacy. It's not a it's not a, a, a global effort in terms of we're going to be the representatives of all African people of the diaspora. It's for the nations and the people of the Caribbean community, because I, I, you know, they know that in order to make legal claims, you got to be specific. You can't, you can't have these vagities and generalities and all that kind of stuff. You have to, you have to be very specific, because you know, one of the things that can happen with with, with court cases. And I'm not saying that reparations is a court case, because for us, reparations is something that needs to be done by Congress. It's something that needs to be legislated into existence. But but when you look at it from the perspective of let's say you approach it from a judicial perspective, what can happen is you can get your case dismissed for failure to state a claim upon which relief could be granted. That's one of the things that they use a lot when people are not laying their cases out properly and can't show that they actually have standing to sue in the court. So I'm just saying we don't want to lose standing. We want to be able to exercise our our right to petition the government for redress of grievance so they can properly respond. We want to do it in a proper manner so that they can properly respond. And if we start making this thing convoluted and making it some kind of African um, diasporic uh, global white supremacist push against the whole entire European diaspora, it's like it, it's, it's, it, 
it's never going to work because the fact of the matter is you're dealing when they say colonial powers these powers are now super well i know the united states is a superpower so in order to deal with the united states we're going to have to deal with it head on we can't the the, the international court uh, uh crim criminal court or whatever it is the, the court of justice for the united nations that that court has no power over the united states i've seen many people bring up the idea that we need to take the united states uh to in front of the united nations the united nations can't force the united states to do a thing the united states is a sovereign superpower in this world it, it, it's nothing that's going to make it do anything other than the people it has to be the will of the people that's going to change this whole situation around and make it be what it is and i think like we said going back to the thing we were talking about earlier we're in a very unique time because what you're seeing is the power of the people making certain things change the fact that it's not just black people but it's blacks it's whites it's asians it's, it's latinos it's a whole bunch of people out in the streets and now because they're out in the streets with people power you start to see all of these different things uh changing that could have been changed years ago stuff that could have happened years ago now it's all of a sudden happening because it's all these people involved and everybody's letting these people letting the government know we're not happy with the way things are and it's got to change one way or the other or maybe some police stations are going to burn or maybe we're going to start shooting at some police cars whatever it is stuff has to change so i think people power is very very important and i think that's what where we are at this point we have to mobilize the people power to make it so that these people in positions of power in in, in the seats of government are going to make the changes necessary that we need at this point in time you know see before you go in chub chub who i mean who was that speaking that was chub getting ready to speak. all right my bad um we're gonna end the live feed on facebook family I don't know what's going on with my live chat on on my stream yard in my back channel. The the comments are coming in like 20 minutes later. That's why I'm not putting up any of the comments on the screen. I didn't even see comments probably for the first 10, 15 minutes of the show. So if you are on, if you're watching on Facebook, I'm going to end the stream on Facebook. I'm going to put the link in the uh, chat on Facebook in the comment section. And... Just come on over to, to YouTube. Come fam. on over to YouTube, fam. All right, yeah, go ahead, brother Chuck. No, what I was saying, the reason why, and I, I, I agree with brother Logic. I agree with all three of you. And we're we're brothers just talking and 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 feeling out the scenario. The reason why it, it's a it's a broad situation is because early America, slavery. 16, 1600s. Who was in America enslaving slaves? See? British, mostly. Exactly. They're part of that system. So look, yeah. but they Let's lost the that's system. A, that's a good point. I, I like that. So now we can we can address. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can that's get to that. Point. 1619, and what you said is true. You had many actors having their many hands was in the slave institutions that were going on in America. That is a historical fact. But for the, for the purposes of our specific justice claim, we're starting our justice claim at 1776 with the formation of the United States of America so that there is a single entity that we're filing this claim with. Not to say that the stuff did not matter or that didn't happen or it didn't exist prior to that, but for the specific, the specificity of this particular justice claim, we have to start with the formation of this country because they had an opportunity, they had an opportunity to not legislate or not allow chattel slavery into their country. They could have created a government that didn't that that did not have chattel slavery, but they chose not to do that. So we are starting it with that moment in history so that there is a specific moment in time and a specific um, perpetrator. Right. So if we get prior to 1619, that starts to make the the, the argument harder to specify, because now you have foreign governments, you got you got the uh, Spanish in Florida. You got you got you got it gets crazy. You got the French running around doing their thing. It gets crazy. So we're talking about American descendants of an American institution. So it's not really an American institution until you have an America, 
an American government. So we're filing our claim with the American government. So it only makes historical sense if we started with the formation of the country. And, and let me just add this. 1776, they, they, they instituted the Declaration of Independence. 1776 Declaration of Independence says that all men, all men created free and equal and were endowed by their creator with unalien certain unalienable rights, that being the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So when, when we talk about they had since 1776 to do right by us, we, we have so much stuff to show, and particularly that particular document, which was the formation document, a lot of people don't know, they may not know that the Declaration of Independence is the founding document for this body politic called the United States. That's the first time that you see the name United States of America on any documents, the Declaration of Independence. And, and so it's founded on these particular principles that are embedded in that document. And it moves from there to the Articles of Confederation to the United States Constitution. And the fact of the matter is they've had since 1776 to do right by us. And so our thing is based on the constitution where it says that the citizens have the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. That's where we are with this thing. So we're doing it based on the fact that we're citizens of this country, taxpaying citizens who have a real grievance with this country, a legitimate grievance that's backed up by history, is backed up by law, is backed up by facts. And, and, yeah. that, and we have a legitimate grievance. And at this point in time, we, we need to deal with it. Because at, if you look at even what some of the economists have been saying, I don't know if we talked about it, so we might have talked about it in the past, but you have a number of economists talking about by 2053, black people will be somewhere around zero dollars in wealth. Mm. We got the graphs to show for that, too. But what, one of the things that make our claim unique is because I'm going to mention two different data points, right? Historical facts, right? One, right? The difference between the American slaves. And I don't want to get too focused on slavery, even though it's very significant. But the difference from slaves in the Caribbean and the slaves in America is about by 1850 and slaves in the Caribbean were like still being like smuggled into the islands and they still had strong African roots and strong African history at that time. And during the same time in 1850, American slaves were like fourth and fifth generation Americans by that same time. So the way that they severed our bond with Africa was more severe and, and, and then anyone else that experienced, you know, the transatlantic slave trip. And the second thing I want to say is we get over focus. I don't want to say over focus because I don't want to diminish the significance of chattel slavery, not one iota. But the other part that makes our claim specific is that during the time of Jim Crow, black codes and up until what, 1865, there was almost no black immigrants in this country. 19, 1965. 1960, my bad. 1965. There was almost no, it was to the right of a decimal point. So we didn't see this big influx of black immigrants from the Caribbean and Africa until after, you know, we had experienced some of the worst times in America and made some of the most significant stride forward, defeating Jim Crow, living through the black codes, 85 years of lynching, on all of that stuff. So that's what makes it specific. Now, if there was a whole millions of people here that experienced that too, that would make this conversation different. But after doing the data, doing the research, we understand that it was just almost really black folks and white folks here. And when I say black folks, I'm talking about American descendants of slavery. I'm talking about descendants of the 4 million freedmen who was emancipated into homelessness and unemployment. That's that's what I'm talking about. So that's what makes it specific. And that's really what I like to talk about when I'm talking about reparations. I like to talk about those brothers and sisters and the family members of mine whose blood and bones are in the soil who were forced. And, and if you look at that situation, you really can't bring up another historical moment or country where they got emancipation in those because slavery is everywhere. But you can't really think about an, or give me, I haven't been able to find it. I'm, maybe I'm not the best researcher. But if there's someone who can find 
another uh, situation where after being the slave of individual white folks, you were emancipated. And then through acts of legislation, you became the slaves of all white folk. And then now and then you were not even in even in Russia, when the serfs was emancipated, they got three acres apiece. We was given 40 acres for a brief moment, and then it was stolen, not by just uh, civilian and private actors and, and rebels and just crazy people running around. This was done by the very head of the United States government. The, the charge was led by the president of the United States, who fact. violated the 14th Amendment, section what, three? Wasn't section it section three? three? Section three. He violated when he put the same people who the 14th Amendment said could not ever hold state office again back into office. Like this was constantly, this is a criminal operation. And every day reparations is not manifested is another crime in progress for a very specific people. Now, we were the only ones here dealing, dealing with that. We was the only ones here dealing with the black code. The, the data supports that. We were the only one here dealing with the 85 years of lynching. We was the only ones here dealing with a slave breeding institution in America where they had bond systems and mortgage systems where they created state and federal banking uh, mechanisms to do international trade and have Britain and uh, other foreign countries bonding mortgages to our very bones and blood. So it's a very specific claim. And I'm for justice everywhere, but I got to be for justice here first before I can help someone else get their justice. I got to get mine. That doesn't mean I don't want it for them. I want them to get their justice and I'll help them get it. But I need them to help me get mine like I want to help them get theirs. Definitely. Brother Chubb, you wanted to speak to anything? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we we are all saying the same thing. We're interjecting various um, thought processes, and um, and I I, I I think it's great stuff, man. <laughs> um, I think it's um, great stuff. All right, brother Ali has something pulled up from the Fourteenth Amendment that he's going to break down real quick, and I, I, this lesson is very very important when we're dealing with the Reconstruction period and and what Andrew Johnson did. What, what, what logic was just explaining. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Ali. Yeah, so this is Section 3, right? 14th Amendment. This is something that a lot of people probably over missed or overlooked over the years, right? Um, and so it's interesting because I was watching C-SPAN. The, 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 the reason that this even came to me, this particular section, was because I'm watching C-SPAN one day and it was a, a sister. She's a constitutional law professor, I think, from John Jay or something like that. And she was doing a lecture on the 14th Amendment and the Reconstruction period and everything. And she was talking about why um, white Americans were pushing against the 14th Amendment, why they didn't want the 14th Amendment to be ratified and uh, adopted and ratified. So she, was and so she was reading it and she was explaining the history behind what was going on. And so section three was very powerful, particularly the 14th Amendment period is powerful, but Section 3 is powerful. So look, let's let's read it. No person shall be a senator or representative. Hold on one second. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president, vice president, or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States, or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States, which shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, be, may by a vote of two thirds of each house remove such disability. So what she was saying when she broke that down, it was when she read that was that the 14th Amendment empowered black Americans and disabled white Americans by section three. Se section one of the 14th Amendment says, all persons born and naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. 
no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So the 14th Amendment empowered the freed the freedmen, but it also disabled, see they even use the terminology in section three, Congress made by a vote of two thirds of each house remove such disability. So what they did was they dis the, the object was to disable those who were in rebellion against the union and empower the freed the freed men and women um, after 1865. So it's, it's very interesting when you start thinking about how Andrew Johnson reversed all of these things and put confederates back in power he was actually in violation of this particular section of uh the 14th amendment so I, I just wanted to read that so not just for the family period this is something this was just a little jewel that i wanted to give to everybody because i think it's a very important aspect of um the reparations claim is something to go along to to strengthen the claim and, and to, to show even more support for it oh yes and and pull my screen up, brother, because I saw in the chat somebody. Uh, I don't know if they was questioning the data, but we do data around here. We don't just make blanket statements without it being rooted in actual research. So, and 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 Chubb, I want to know what you think about this after I read it too. What you, just what your opinion is on it? On this is like really our position nationally by every legitimate metric. There is, and this is, can be found on ADOS, American Descendants of Slavery 101.com. Uh, this is on the roadmap to reparations section because you don't know where you're going unless you got a map, right? All right. So, by every legitimate metric, there is a multi trillion dollar debt. However, the sum will not be paid out to Black Americans at large, but would instead go specifically to the progeny of victims of American chattel slavery and the oppressions that follow, such as Jim Crow. Using the standards set out in the paper by Professor Darity and Professor Frank, the, econom the economics of reparations, the criteria for eligibility would be, and we're talking about being eligible for to be a part of or a recipient of a pure reparations program enacted by Congress. An individual would, one, an individual would have to provide reasonable documentation of at least one ancestor enslaved in the United States. And two, they would need to demonstrate they have identified as black African-American colored or Negro on established legal documents for at least 10 years prior to the onset of the program. And from here to equality, I think the, rec the uh, recommendation is 12 years before the establishment of a commission to study reparations or the enactment of a reparations program. All right, so uh, moving on. In no, in, in addition, we would add that at least one grandparent fulfills both prongs of the criteria if a person is biracial. Effectively, this would limit reparations solely to those people who have lineage that lies that ties them both to slavery in the United States and the subsequent era of Jim Crow. Any black immigrant who came to the United States voluntarily after slavery would not be eligible to receive reparations. That word voluntarily is very key. All right. This distinction is critical since a sizable number of black immigrants, immigrants, in fact, arrived in the U.S. following black America's most historically significant and economically detrimental periods that occurred prior to civil war, I mean, civil rights movement, prior to the civil rights movement, right? What I was just talking about earlier. In fact, few, if any, voluntarily black immigrants outside of students were in the United States prior to the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. As shown by the Smithsonian before 1965, Black people of foreign birth residing in the United States were nearly invisible. According to the 1960 census, their percentage of the population was to the right of a decimal point. Importantly, this pre-1965 group of Black immigrants mostly originated from the Caribbean and as such would have their own particular claims to make against Europe, European nations for the harms they suffered based on 
on the slavery institution within the Caribbean, within their Caribbean country of origin. Reparations for American chattel slavery would exclude black immigrant populations that voluntarily migrated to America, which since 1980 have undergone an unprecedentedly sharp expansion, increasing from 816,000 in 1980 to 4.2 million as of 2016. After deducting for these foreign born blacks and their offspring con con conceived by two parents who didn't who didn't descend from American child slavery, the recipient group shrinks substantially. So I know that was a lot I just read, but it really kind of outlines the type of specificity that we're talking about for 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 reasons that we've discussed already. So um, if anyone wants to comment on that criteria uh, and uh, speak to that concerns, if uh, objections to that criteria, if you think it's good, if you think it's problematic, say something about it. And I just I read that because I saw a comment in the uh, chat section in the chat. And I just want people to know we're not just saying stuff. This stuff is actually built on actual studies. Uh, federal census, Smithsonian Institute research, data. We're not just saying things that sound good. We're actually rooted in actual real research. Yeah. What were your thoughts on that, Chubb, and reading that? You know, the specificity that's laid out in our specific claim that if you voluntarily came to the United States of America, you're not a party of this particular justice claim. Your justice claim lies in the country where the wrongs were done to you and your people. Because there are some that have made the argument, uh, some from the Caribbean islands, that they say that they should receive reparations from the American government as well because they've gone through some of the hardships once they got over here and, and we can start really, I know in New York, the Jamaican population started to really kick up in the 1980s. So, you know, what, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so you don't ever want to, to Brother Logic, you know, confuse things to the point that the confusion slows the train down. Right. You, if you have a criteria and you believe that will be the most effective way to get to a, a desired result, then you stick to the criteria. There's always going to be an argument when it comes to any of these things. But if that's the criteria, it's like anything, man. If you stick to the narrative and you, what your, your, your focus is, then you can, once you get the desired result, then you can help all the different offshoots of certain things. Because Caribbean people can say this. They weren't brought, they didn't come here voluntarily. They used basically Caribbean stud, using a very loose term here. They used the Caribbean stud making just to make more slaves here. So they were brought for a purpose that they believed would help them get more slaves and create more slaves here. Because there's a scientific discussion that, and I remember seeing this on a, on a, on a medical um, discussion, how the American male slave life expectancy was 26, 27, and the Caribbean male expectancy during slavery was in the 40s. So they was back and forth to pregnant women here to keep that, you know, that's that, that, that creation of bodies here. So, so when you use the word voluntarily, it becomes very interesting, right? It becomes very interesting. You're saying voluntarily in the 60s that's a loose term because i had certain family members of the caribbean that came here because they were basically 
yes, it's the 60s and slavery isn't around anymore. But basically, let's say, not even the word convinced, but brought here because they had certain skills to do things here. Mm. You feel what I'm saying to you? And these skills were not skills that they just totally said, hey, man, let's go to America and share our skills. Right? There were certain influences for that. Underwater, underwater welding. You know, whenever you're driving through your midtown tunnels and all of that, that's done by Caribbean people. So there was reasons to bring people with those knowledge of those things here. So, yes, I still say if that's the narrative and if that's the focus of the structure, then stay to the focus and get the desired result. And then you can help the other factions because the other factions, of course, will have will have a, a you know various different claims because again and you know what's interesting and C knows this I mean all all three of you know you're all smarter than me you guys know that the connection between America and Europe and for I mean that's the word they they use a nice colorful word now oh allies but the reality to it was it was still an interjected system. Right? It was an interjected system. So I get you got to start with something. So I think if you if you have that, then stick to that narrative. You stick to that narrative, and then again you can help the various factions. Factions because the word voluntarily is interesting. All right. Well, but, no. but you will agree that there are some. Who did voluntarily come, right? Yeah, of, of course. I mean, later on, and at a certain time, you know, people came because in the hopes of, you know, having a better life and and maybe some better opportunities. Mm -hmm. Okay, without question, without question. And so, and and long as that people understand, also there were some that was forced here for different reasons, and mainly because of the skills that they possessed. Yeah. What I okay. want to do is I want to get into this uh, from the Pew Research Center um, because I think that this is important in understanding, you know, because we can have a discussion. But what we do here on BTP and, and what many will find in, in the ADO, ADOS movement in general, as we give a shout out to Brother Antonio Moore, Sister Yvette Carnell, Dr. Sandy Darity, his wife, Kirsten Mullins, you know, is that we we ground everything in numbers and in research so that we're not just coming from opinions, but we're coming from the, the aggregate information that has been developed over several decades. So this is published January 24th, 2018, Fact Tank News and the numbers. I want to get to through some of these points. It says the United States has has long had a sizable black population because of the transatlantic slave trade beginning in the 16th century. But significant voluntary black migration is a relatively new development and one that has increased rapidly over the past two decades. Here's a closer look at the small yet growing black immigrant population in the US. So it, it, there's a chart here. Um, like I said, in New York, I start to notice a lot of Jamaicans coming into the city in, in the early 80s, right? And, and they brought the reggae with them. There was an infusion of dance hall into, into the New York music scene, an infusion of, of Jamaican culture. Till this day, we still eat our beef patties with our cocoa bread and, and things of that nature, right? So, but this chart is showing that from 1980, it says total foreign born black population in the US and thousands. So in 1980, we have 816, and then it, it moves up 10 years later. It goes every 10 years, right? 1,447, then in 2000, 2,436, then in 2016, 4,173. Now remember, this is in thousands, right? So I want to start to read 
at some of these points. It's a, uh, point one, the black immigrant population has increased fivefold since 1980. So even if we go back to the 60s, we're still looking at this relatively low, almost imperceptible number of immigrants that's coming over. We have somebody in the chat named Kyrie P, I believe, that's given a bunch of opinion, but he or she is not providing any data or any statistics. And, and what our job is, is to try to correct some of that thinking, not by our own opinions, but with what the data and the statistics say. So it says there were 4.2 million black immigrants living in the U.S. in 2016, up from just 816,000 in 1980, according to a Pew Research Center analysis of U.S. Census Bureau data. Since 2000 alone, the number of black immigrants living in the country has risen 71%. So remember, this article is written in, in 2018, January 24th, 24, 2018. But it notes that since the year 2000, 20 years ago, the number of black immigrants living in the country has risen 71%. Now, roughly one in 10 blacks, 9%, living in the U.S. are foreign born, according to the 2016 American Community Survey data, up from 3% in 1980. Immigrants make up 10% of the black population in the March 2016 current population survey. So, and, and there's a reason why, you know, we have to get into these charts. We have to get into these numbers because when we're dealing with specificity, keyword specificity, we have to be specific. So it doesn't matter if they were immigrants came over and, and some may not like that term. So we could say Jamaicans or Haitians, et cetera, came over to do certain jobs. Number one, we were boxed out of getting the training from some of those jobs. We had instances, and Brother Ali can go into this a little more in depth, where you had brothers from the South moving to the North, trying to get into some of the unions that had way more skills than the white workers but we're boxed out in, in getting those jobs. So, yeah, we can say that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and even, even in that data, right, we, we kind of left room for what uh, Chubb brought up and talked about, even though we didn't get specific on it because it doesn't really build the case that we're making. But we said that, um, that the presence was to the right of a decimal point. So we didn't say that they weren't none here. But the ones that we can verify that were here were not that many or, or it wasn't enough to actually, you know, impact the decimal point. So what we're saying is there could there there. We sure that there were some here and what you're saying may have a, a strong merit to it. But we're talking about the large case that is going to impact the most people. And it's very specific because there was a harm, a specific harm that was done to a large group of people that has a long lasting history from start to present, from the formation of the country to where we're at right now. That includes all of these people and their descendants, and they were here for all of it. So we're talking about the people that were here from all of it and all of the contributions that they did as well from fighting in every single war, from building and being the actual currency that have made America great for producing the cotton and the tobacco that and the, the, the and being the the labor force that produced the textile industry 80 percent of the textile industry exports for Britain and all of that this was law at large was a specific group now if there were uh twos and fews not to diminish their significance but if there were twos and fews that's fine but we can't like and, and, and if those are specific cases, they can go ahead and, 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 and make their specific case as individuals, but it could not be attached to an entire Caribbean population or or anything like that. And, there, and the case for the Caribbean can't be built on the backs of American descendants of slavery because now you're double dipping because because I can't go to Jamaica or Haiti and get reparated let's say let's say i went to haiti today lived there for 20 years and then 20 years from later haiti got reparations from france 
I can't sit here and say I deserve reparations from France too for the Haitian suffering. I don't have any grandparents and great grandparents and I didn't help liberate Haiti. I didn't help make Haiti what it is. Uh, my people wasn't there dying and going, being buried in the ground in Haiti and picking all the sugar cane and whatnot. My people was here in America. But what I would do, I would help and support those Haitians to get that reparation seen through and make it manifest. I would be there like y'all deserve that. Y'all definitely right. Y'all deserve that straight up. And that's how I would be with them. That would be my position with them. I would be willing to fight tooth and nail with them to get that done for them. But in no way would I think that I deserve to benefit from their ancestors suffering. suffering. Same thing. And now we come to America. I want y'all, whoever, you know, to understand, yes, we all been through something. But when we're talking about specific fights, you understand, like this is our fight over here. Help us be allies, be be reparationists. If you're a reparationist, you're for reparations everywhere. But you understand that that doesn't mean everybody gets reparations everywhere. You understand? So the where we're going to get our reparations, American reparations are going to go to American descendants of slavery for this specific justice claim. That's what it's designed for. And that's what we're fighting for. And that's what we're trying to build national support for and we need help from everybody we're not trying to isolate nobody from this we just want them to understand what this actually is and addressing all the concerns that you brought forth in the beginning of the show about how it's not just a check that we're just throwing at and that we really want to build a comprehensive program so there is acknowledgement redress and closure so we can close this chapter and move on and be what we were always meant to be so we just trying to get an understanding for all the family that's out there yes indeed, indeed. Yeah. indeed. um brother chubb or brother ali um i don't know what your time is looking like brother chubb but uh just let us know you know when when because we usually run our show about two hours so we definitely don't want to hold you up at all um so just let us know whenever your your time constraints you know happen or if you have any time constraints rather and and you know we'll close the show or we have finished speaking and just finished building with the family but let me just say real quick i want to give a shout out to everybody that's watching please hit the like button share donate you could cash app at lord app i'm about to change that up to go directly to btp I've just been being lazy the past couple of days. I've been studying so hard, to be honest with you. My mental hasn't been lazy at all. And um, shout out to, to Brother Chubb Rock for coming on yes, and having this discussion because there are celebrities that don't want to have the discussion. You know, we watch how Brother, you know, T.I., when, when Brother Reggie from Boston called in, talked to that brother very condescendingly. And, you know, it... it rubbed me the wrong way because y'all are a mouthpiece in a space that our voices cannot reach. Y'all are our megaphones. And this is why sometimes celebrity tends to complicate things. And if we can't have a discussion where there's a, an educational aspect going on, we can never move forward together. And so the people at the bottom still stay at the bottom. The celebrity gets to go home to his nice house while driving his or her nice car, right? But the people at the bottom are still at the bottom and we're trying to bring our people to, we're just trying to close the gap at the end of the day. A lot of the issues that we have stem from the fact that America never atoned for her original sin, which is slavery. And that sin has been horrendous for us. While they lived like, like fat cats, We've merely been like ticks on their necks that after a while they scratched off and, and stepped on, right? And every time a little body would grow back, they just scratch it off again and just step on it again. So, you know, I just want to give you honors for coming on and having the conversation, brother, because it's definitely, definitely needed. Man. Let me tell you, man, me and C would have these conversations <laughs> for years. And we would have these breakdown sessions and, 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 you know, I believe one of the best things on the planet, man, is the ability to learn. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It, I mean, there's nothing better than that. And when you can sit there and just take it in and listen to brothers and sisters and you can hear some knowledge and you can hear some things and you can have your perspective. And then I could hear Brother Logic's pers- perspective. I could hear, see, I could just hear these various different perspectives and I can go back and say, wow. Because sometimes it's like medicine, right? Medicine don't always hit you immediately. They say, oh, take this and you, you, you know, you take the, you'll get the effects tomorrow and two days from now and three mm-hmm. days from now. So you need that, man. And I, the only thing I would tell you guys, and I hope, and I hope this, I'm, I'm, I'm only putting it out there that I could be invited again. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely. I, I, I could be invited again because, definitely. Definitely. you know, there's so much more. I wanted to come here, some of the perspectives, what the framework is. Mm-hmm. And then the next time I'm invited, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> because mm-hmm. I would have time yes, to yes. absorb this mm-hmm. particular get together, right? Mm-hmm. And then I could come back now and say, "Okay, I'm like my grandmother. You know, I'm pen and paper person. Mm-hmm. I would have it in front of me." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Naheem, here are my questions for you. Definitely. <laughs> and then boom, see, <laughs> Logic, <laughs> da, 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 da. brother Josh. I, here's here's the questions. How do we get here? What's the approach to Congress? Who's representing mm. the approach? Mm. Come on now. You know, at, at that point, I would have mm-hmm. I could talk in a in a certain manner. Because let me mm-hmm. tell you something, it, it, and and I hate to bring up these music metaphors or even that's so good tie it down oh, to it. But that's, what we, that's, that's what we kind of grew up with, right? So it reminds me of. <clears throat> If you were an if you were an, an artist from say whenever to uh, I don't even I can't even put this the exact year but let's say 2005 6 so 2005 or 6 backwards you looked in any of those contracts and it said you agree to get x amount of percentage from your records and your recordings will be classified as such cassettes, CDs, albums. So if you signed those documents back then and you said, okay, well, I'm getting X amount of percentage for these records, but then 2005, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 comes and all of a sudden you know your song, like "Treat Him Right," and and and, yeah. and, and all the other the, the, the logic that he he used to dance to back in the day, and, That's right. and and all your songs come now, and now these songs are getting streamed like crazy, and 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 and, and downloaded, and this and that, and boom, 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 and then you go to your record company, but you 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 might not be on that contract anymore, but that contract still stands, right? So they say, you say, hey man, um. A song is being streamed like crazy and, and 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 it's on YouTube like crazy and and people are downloading and and they say oh yeah but we don't have to pay you for that because in your contract it says we pay you for cassettes CDs and albums there's no there's no mentioning in your contract that says stream hmm. there's no mentioning in your contract that says downloading mm-hmm. you created this new right system. But it's still, but it's still my music, though. But you still, so you're still, you're still taking something that I created. That now you have a new system, in which to get that music. But I am not privy or have any rights to it because in the contract, that system wasn't created yet. Hmm. That's a fact. And that's a that's facts. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying. The next time I come in, I would love. To find out how this fight doesn't go through something like that, hmm. right? I, let me because, say real quick, Chubb. I think the the best book that you could get right now is Dr. Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullins' book, 
from here to equality, it, it really will help, I think, better than this discussion will, right? So when you come back, even if you have questions, you'll have a, a manual, if you will, in front of you to put put your questions in a better perspective, a framework, because you may read something and say, you know, I got a question about that. Let me highlight that. And when I come back on the show, we can get the build about this and we get the build about that. There's several other books and people. Oh, without, without question, brother, I'm a yellow marker fanatic. <laughs> okay, I, I, will, I will yellow marker it to death. Definitely. Okay? Because here's my thing. The, and I like what Brother Logic said, Oh, was, was, was it, it might have been um, Brother um, Ali said something. Hey, this is not a court fight. That's how Ali right? said because that. The court system <laughs> is the system with more trickery than you've ever seen in your life. Hence my argument about artists that are trying to sue for their own music stuff, but for a system that wasn't created yet when mm -hmm. they signed that contract mm -hmm. so Crazy. again you you'll probably find that america would love for you to take it into the court system to take the fight into the court system because that court system is built on building blocks that are not logic it is right. not based on logic well you know chubb it's already been done See, that's the thing. That's how we we're at the place where we know it's not um, something to be dealt with in the judiciary because it's already been attempted. Johnny Cochran has tried it. Um, a number of other people have tried it. What they did in the federal court was they consolidated a bunch of slavery um, reparations for slavery lawsuits, consolidated them and dismissed them all at one time. Yeah. And, and um, with prejudice because they said they didn't have stand in the suit. And they also said, not only did they not have stand in the suit, but they also said that um, they failed to state a claim to bring, failed to state a claim upon which relief could be granted. And the fact um, that they themselves were not slaves. And so they, it also that reparations was too comprehensive of an issue to be dealt with by the judiciary. It's something that would have to have been dealt with through the, legislat the legislative and the executive branches of government. And so they call it, a, it raises too much of a political question to be dealt with in the judiciary. So right. this is something that we, all, we already knew because it, it's, it's already been done and dismissed on a number of occasions. Yeah. Facts. Ali has been like laying that out for years for us. Can I read something real quick? Cause I'm glad you brought, like what you said was so powerful cause you said it right after Naheem mentioned, you know, from here to equality and Dr. Derry and his wife mentioned something i mean they, they they addressed it specifically right so let me just read that because that's what we're rooted in we're really we're rooted in from here to equality and and like i want to read this right so check yeah. it out right it says the invoice for reparations must go to the nation's government the u.s government as the federal authority bears responsibility for sanctioning maintaining and enabling slavery legal segregation and continued racial inequality. Specifically, the invoice should go directly to the U.S. Congress, the legislative branch of the national government. Jurisdiction over the matter of black reparations should be removed from the judicial system for three fundamental reasons. One, lawsuits brought against corporations, colleges, and universities for their participation in slavery are unlikely to succeed because slavery was legal at the time that they engaged in the practice. Their activities were undoubtedly immoral, but they were not illegal at the time. Two, in order to sue the U.S. government for uh, reparations, the continuation of racial violence and discrimination in the post-civil war right uh the post the post civil rights legislation era one would have to establish that the u.s government agencies knowingly and un and intentionally did not enforce the new laws this would require an effort of xenesque xenesque proportions that just means large right if you ever seen Xena, the warrior princess, you know what it means, a strong and powerful, right? The court three, 
The courts do not. This is what Ali was talking about when he closed out his statement. The courts do not have the capacity to implement or enforce any legal mandate that might hand down for blacks reparations. And that's just a quick they go into it deeper. But that's just a quick response they had to uh, the specific judicial uh, situation. Brother Josh, you had a question? I uh, just wanted to say, man, thank you for coming on the show. And, um, you know, we, we'd love to have you back again. Powerful Bill. Um, I wanted to ask a question. We talked about it for, right before the show. But um, we were talking about the role of, um, of, of celebrity. And, you know, I, the reason I want to say thank you is because there are a lot of, a lot of you know, voices in, in um, Black celebrity, whether it be music or entertainment, that, do not want to have these type of conversations or they don't they don't they they maybe it's good that they're not having the conversations because they feel like that they're not educated and they need to kind of just kind of sit back but for those who want to learn or those who actually uh are in entering the conversation um do you think that it's it's a good thing that they're entering the conversation number one and do you think that they're they could do some harm is because um I guess the question I need a context I need to add is, do you think that there is an effort uh, by large media, by America, by, you know, pol politics to use um, certain black celebrities and certain prominent voices in our community uh, to kind of mask the, the failures and, and mask the, uh, you know, the deficiencies and, and all, all the issues that we have uh, in the black community? How do you what do you think about that? I mean, you know, one of the easiest things is to cause distractions. And causing distractions gets you to be unfocused with what the task is. Now, I've never been a conspiracy. I mean, I, I don't want to use the word conspiracy theorist. I believe all people should want to learn something if they don't know it. Right. If they, if they, I mean, it's just what it is. If I've never changed the tire, I don't want people to insult me and say, hey, oh, man, you're, you're a lazy bum. You don't know how to change a tire. How could you be a man? You don't. Change? OK, but let me then learn. <laughs> you know, let me watch someone who knows how to do it. And then let me listen to brothers telling me not how, you know, don't do this. You can get yourself killed and don't do that. And this is the way you do this. And here's your tire pressure. I mean. Learning, like I said earlier, is an important thing. Sometimes, you know, people even put out there sometimes, man, they maybe even threaten you. Hey, maybe your career is going to be over if you even try to learn. Hmm. You know, hmm. you don't even have to participate, you know, except for you're learning. You know, think about the Matrix movie. Hey, man, I'm going to take you out of the Matrix. <laughs> oh, man, there's, there's a punishment for that. Mm. You know, so, I mean, you never know. I don't know everybody's individual concerns about learning and 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 joining the discussion. You know, uh, uh, brother Ali talked about it earlier. There, there's there's white, you know, people that's joining that discussion. Yeah, <laughs> you feel me? So at the end of the day, I think sincerity plays the role, right? It's very easy to just say, "Man, I don't know." I, I, that's that's a legitimate answer. Mm. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's right. And then somebody, if you hope that they would then give you their knowledge, and then someone else would give you some of their knowledge, and and then believe it or not, everybody's going to take the same knowledge and have a different perspective or maybe a different approach. You know, but long as everything is going for the, the same desired results, you know, I don't I don't see the, the problem, man. That's why. I, for me, I wanted to come for a, a specific reason. I wanted to hear, I wanted to absorb, I wanted to learn. And then when I come back, I wanna ask, I wanna give some examples, I wanna give some history. I wanna see if the history I have is wrong because right? everybody has a different history. I mean, the transcribing of it. 
Mm -hmm. History is supposed to be definitive, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This happened, this happened. But some, however you transcribe that history can be very different. And people can transcribe it. And purposely transcribe it wrong sometimes. Hmm. That's right. To cause a distraction. So to me, man, maybe because, you know, I used to always say I'm a Gemini and bipolar. There's four of me on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to I take it all in and then come back and have my questions, man. I want to come back and have my yellow marker and say, okay, this is what I learned. And even what I learned can be wrong. Mm. I mean, that's what we are. But again, going after a goal, they got to be a definitive thing. Mm -hmm. They got to be a definitive thing. You can't make it so broad that it just never gets done. You got to, at some point, cut it down to its very last compound. See how it sounds? A little unrational. Terrorist mm -hmm. one. You know, you got to bring it down to something. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, so I, I think the. Um, I, I I I really enjoyed this discussion, man. I mean, if it wasn't for the fact I got to wake up at four in the morning, I would stay on here. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I just want to say I, I appreciate you coming on, bro, because this is a very um, passionate subject for a lot of people, and um, the fact that you actually, you know, um, step, you know, stepped out there and said, you know, you willing to have the conversation it, it, again, it's amazing to me, you know. Yeah, and have it again. Yeah, and have it again. And you wouldn't believe this. After we have it again, you wouldn't believe what I would like to do after that. What's have that? it again. No, that's <laughs> no <job. laughs> hey, 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 so, <laughs> so, maybe, maybe, maybe at some point, maybe at some point we could we could do some of this on, on your show. That would be that would be excellent, man. That's any time, brother. That's any time because I, I try to be informative. I, I try to, you know. And we have fans that listen that ask these questions and they want to learn. They want somebody to tell them something. You know, this is again, you're not going to learn it in school. Right. You're not going to see it on the news. So here we are. Right. Here we are. Five brothers in the middle of the night having a discussion in front of <laughs> incredible Facebook people and YouTube people. <clears throat> so it, it just, it, it, it has to keep on going, man, because I got my son and I'm sure they will sit there and go, I heard you having a conversation and I heard a couple of buzzwords there. What was this? What was that? What was this? What was that? And who knows, maybe the next time then he's next to me because he <clears throat> wants to, hear it and he has a newer brain than I do and he might say yeah pop but you know you were thinking about it this way and mm -hmm. brother Ali thought about it this way but I've learned this so I've seen this or the, you know because that's the chain right that's the chain that we all are supposed to learn from each other and building blocks of you know of knowledge and, and things of that nature man and um yeah I, I love this stuff man I mean you know, yes, indeed. The framework of it is incredible. I I applaud all of you. I will get that book. Excellent. We'll get the book. Excellent. This way, I would have, uh, depending on when I'm I'm invited to come back, and um, I would have read all of it or most of it, and mm -hmm. and um, use my yellow marker and and ask a bunch of questions. And because I got questions now, but I want to read yeah. a couple of things first. Mm -hmm. You know. And 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 then approach it with. It's always going to be approached with sincerity, but approach it with a little more, you know, of an of an analysis, for the lack of a better, you know, term, for the discussion, man. Because yeah. you guys got it together, man. You guys got it together. This no, we, we we still learning too. We still learning. We 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 climbing up that mountain. We we're climbing. Yeah. Very nice stuff, man. Just a little, uh, you know, up up on the mountain, more up on the mountain than our climb, than 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 some are, and that's because we listen to the excellent 
political and statistical breakdowns of uh, Sister Yvette Carnell and Brother Antonio Moore and and everybody involved in the ADOS movement. I want to just give a shout out to everybody in, in the ADOS movement. Shout out to, to the OG Otis as well. Shout out to Dr. Darity. Shout out to our mod, Sister Cynthia, Brother Nick, uh, Dark Skin Beauty. Uh, shout out to ADOS Los Angeles. Shout out to ADOS Sacramento, ADOS New York. Shout out to the family all over ADOS Chicago. We are learning and we're growing and we're trying to take this particular platform right here and focus it on what I call the, the oil well of, of untapped votes, which is our people that are largely in the streets because our voting percentage, as Brother Logic points out often on the show, is 12.5%. And, and we're trying to get that to 25% and eventually 50%. And hopefully one day we can get that to a 75% turnout. So one of the things that Be The Power is, is striving to do is push this conversation to the streets while the people that are in political spaces can see and understand it as well. So, you know, we, we're trying to... I don't want to use the term dumb it down because we're not doing that. We're bringing straight facts and, and things of that nature, but we're trying to make the conversation palatable to those that need to understand that politics is what runs this country. Everything that we've ever done was involving politics. Oh, you look at Luke Campbell and the two live crew, their pushback when they first came out, it was political. You have politicians down in Florida saying that their music was too vile and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, they went to court and, and the court said, well, you know, freedom of speech at the end of the day. And we got to see that play out that if, if we're citizens, then you can't deprive them of their freedom of speech. And so what we're saying as American descendants of slavery is if we're citizens, you cannot deprive us of the economic opportunities that you have been subsisting off of for the past 300 plus years. You have to make us whole in this country so that we can be full American citizens. So, you know, you know, it's you know, interesting. Mm -hmm. Two things before um, I say good night, man. Uh, one of the things is there's somebody that needs to be involved in this discussion mm. and I, I got I got their name in my mind okay and, and they need to be on this the next time and you wouldn't be disappointed okay okay and and um and it's funny that you said that you know you talked about Luke Skywalker and you said uh you know they try to mask the issue that they had with him around censorship and language and mm -hmm. reality and rock and roll guys was using that language way before Luke Skywalker. <laughs> what really was the case was money. Mm. Right. Because they said, Hey, George Lucas is going to sue you for a fictional name. Since when can you sue someone for a fictional character name? <laughs> <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? Yeah, you might have come up with the word Luke Skywalker, but hey, the guy's name is Luke, and then he just used that last piece and mm -hmm. and blah blah blah, and it's fictional anyway, right? So there's right. always these made up things, right? So, um, but I just I just wanted to point that out because you yeah, brought that out there. But uh, man, again, guys, I, I appreciate it, man. I'm I'm. Uh, you know, if you guys allow me to come back, I would love to. Oh, definitely. Come back with a little more breakdown, and you'll and you'll see in front of me when I come too, so you won't. <laughs> you'll see the papers in front of me. <laughs> definitely, and, uh, right, and we can go in there and have that, man. But I really appreciate you guys allowing me to, um, you men to uh, allowing me to uh, be part of this, um, serious discussion, and uh, I learned a lot and. And, and I would love to be, uh, you know, invited again. Oh, we will hey. definitely have you back on, brother. No doubt. Listen, love you, man. Love you too, bro. Definitely, man. And, you know, I'm going to call you anyway tomorrow. All right. Because, um, you know, at least it's the end of the 
waking up at four in the morning tomorrow because tomorrow's <laughs> Friday. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah. Um, but definitely, man, I, I really appreciate it. And if you get a chance, see, the, the couple of things that you put up on the screen yeah. today, mm -hmm. if you can email that to me, I would be appreciative. And Brother Logic, you had put something on the, on the screen, too. Uh, I think, well, you didn't put it on the screen. You didn't get a chance to, but you were reading it. If you can... Is that the book you was reading? Hey, 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 Chubb, Chubb, we're going to hook you up. Don't worry about it, bro. We got you. We're going to hook you up. Okay. Bro. We got you, brother. I appreciate it, man. Uh, uh, yeah. Rock will give you my email, man, and, and uh, love you guys, man. Be safe out there. too, man. Thank you. Right, we, love you we love you, brother. Gratitude, gratitude. Appreciate you. All right. Same here. So definitely, man, family, it was good to have our good brother Chubb on. Um, I think you can close it out, Chubb. Okay, there you go. There we go. There you go. And you know, I want to give a shout out to my team, of course. Uh, shout out to to my brother Ali. You know, like I said earlier, when I when I first start building with this brother, it was like two years before he let me know that he was very well connected in the music industry. He sent me a a link. And he was like, I helped produce. I don't know. I think it, was, it may have been a Patty LaBelle joint. I can't fully remember. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was confused. I was like, what, what, is, what is he talking about? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I help produce this. That's my name. I ain't going to say his government name on the air. And he was like, that's my name. Yada, yada, yada. yada. I, look, I was like, oh, I was like, so did he just start running down this history to me? And I'm like, damn, I known this brother for two years at least. And this brother had never said anything about it. And, and that just shows the, the humility and those those are the type of things that as we grow as individuals, we impress upon ourselves. That left an indelible mark on me. So honors to my brother Ali, man, and, and shout out to the squad. Peace, man. I appreciate no that. Doubt. So um brother Josh, uh, you was um I know you was were, were a little busy for and, and couldn't necessarily jump on tonight. But um, if you had anything to say, we're going to just run a, run through the circle real quick so that we could we could close the show out. And Hey, shout out to Riri, my sister. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Shout Love out. You, sis. Love Yo, you. Definitely, man. Shout out to Sister Riri shout out. That as well. Oh, wait, I got a, 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 an announcement to make from my mother. She said if we do another show going at Farrakhan, we're going to have problems. So I, I just wanted to let y'all know that. <laughs> she said, we're going to have problems if we say something else about Farrakhan. So I think we're going to have to chill. We're, we're going at Farrakhan, y'all. Okay. okay. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, man. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to reiterate that this is a powerful build tonight. This is a powerful build tonight. You know, this, this build tonight, it felt like one of our builds in... Um, uh, one of our daily bills, our offline or off mm -hmm. off the air bills, you know, those just brothers mm -hmm. talking yep. and, and and trying to do um, move this thing in the right direction. And I think what we saw tonight was real reparation, people being real reparationists, you know, mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. reparationists. Mm -hmm. And that's being able to have a conversation where you take a person and you move them from where they are thinking wise to where they need to be thinking wise as far as being a reparationist. You know, I mean, I, I think this is a powerful bill. You know, we really laid the case out um, for our justice claim. And we really, uh, I mean, we really just, I, I think also it takes a person to be in a place where they're sincerely interested and sincerely Yes. wanting to hear the message and, and yes. they really are an ally, I wouldn't even say an ally or a brother in uh, the struggle in the, in the first place. It takes that fertile ground. But, you know, it also takes people who know how to have the argument in place. And it also takes people who uh, are, are concerned, are concerned enough about that person to, to talk at a, in a way where they can receive it, where they can understand it and not be compromising um, in in their language, in in any of the data, the information, you know. So I, I really appreciate how uh, we were able to make that case tonight. Y'all did an excellent job, man. I was following along, but uh, man, this that, that I really enjoy watching that. 
Yeah. Honors, brother. Honors. Reparation is out here. That's right. All right, brothers. Um, your brother, brother Logic, you want to go in? Yo, you man. Absolutely. Outstanding show. I want to thank everybody who tuned in tonight. We kept for the majority of the program, the viewership was a hundred plus. Appreciate y'all participating and contributing to growing this platform. We're trying to, you know, put out a pure message of reparations out to the to the public while we engage on this campaign to um, produce and help lift and generate national support for a peer reparations program. We're going to be doing it with things like this. We're going to try to mix it up. You know how we do people who've been paying attention. We're going to be doing education. We're going to be doing conversation and we're just going to be doing a lot of different things, trying to get it to happen. But a lot of, a lot of it happens like we just uh, gave an example of tonight, just real conversations with people. You know what I mean? And uh, I really want to thank, Chub Rock for coming out and having this discussion because he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to come on here and be that candid with us and have this discussion and admit to the things that he didn't know and the things that he was willing to know. He didn't have to. You don't see a lot of celebrities who are willing to be challenged and things of that nature. So I want to really thank that brother for sacrificing his time to come on our platform to be the power platform and have a reparationist discussion and do some reparationist talk with us. And the true job and duty and the, and the true challenge of a real reparationist is to make other reparationists. That's our job. It's not just to get a, in a big circle, a kumbaya circle of everybody who agrees with you. We, uh, if you know the data and everything, that's great. You need to be out there and teach somebody else. If you're a reparationist, I love you. You go out there and make someone else a reparationist. That's what the work is, because until we build the national support for it, we will not manifest a reparations program for the American sense of slavery. So that's the message that logic has for y'all, because it makes the most logical sense. If you want to do the reparationist work, know that it's rooted in making other reparationists. And with that, y'all, I say peace. Brother Ali. Peace. I'm good, man. I, I think um I think we've exhausted it all. You know, I, I I'm just glad and grateful that we was able to do it, you know. Definitely, definitely. I'm I'll I'll close us out again. I echo my brother Logic uh, and, and my brother Josh. You know, to have brother Chubb Rock come on. I mean, <laughs> like I, I was telling them earlier in the back chat that I was telling my children that we were going to have Chubb on the show tonight. And they was like, who is that? Who is that, right? But as soon as I put that song on, oh, they was like, oh, I know that song. Because that joint still slap all these years later. And it's going to slap for another 30, 40 more years on down the line, right? And for him to, to come on and, and be challenged on his position, because one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of celebrities have very fragile egos and they don't want the cracks in their egos to ever be shown on in the public, right? They're supposed to be invincible. Like Kanye really believes the stuff that he said, that Harriet Tubman was basically helping white people and, and whatever crazy nonsense that brother said, but we would love to have him on the show, right? <laughs> I would love to have Kanye. Oh, man, that would be crazy. <laughs> and that would be very literally, crazy. Literally crazy. <laughs> it so, would be psychotic. It would be literally psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for that brother to come on and do that, man, that, that to come on this platform and, and have his views challenged as a brother that was born in Jamaica, you know, oh, he, was born in, he was born in Brooklyn. He was born in okay. so, Jamaican descent. Of yeah. Jamaican descent, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to come on and, and have that viewpoint challenge so that we could have the broader discussion and, and open up this conversation, like I was saying on, the, on one of the other shows about being a reparationist. You know, we can extend that now, right? You could be a, a white reparationist. You could be a Jamaican reparationist, a, a Haitian reparationist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That justice for us brings about a greater America 
in my opinion. Once that justice happens, it it helps put us on even kill. And in my opinion, it helps the country begin this healing process that's long overdue. We're not going to say that these problems are going to go away overnight once this program uh, gets passed, right? Mm. We're not saying that at all. It's, it's going to be generational. But we have to start, and we have to start here at this period in this moment, because as we were saying earlier before we got on, there's no more important time than this moment because there's really no more important time than right now. The past gives us what we need to make the claim in the moment. And we don't look too far into the future. We, we don't have to. But we can speculate that the future will be great, not just for America's descendants of slavery, but for the country in general once America does what it's supposed to do for our people. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Shout out to everybody in the chat, man. Shout out to our mods again. And honest to my bro. We have the best. I love y'all. We have the best. <laughs> what, what you, you Oh, you said we have the best people. We, we getting on our down, down the trunk. We have, we have the best <laughs> We have the best people. So we're going to end the show, family. Thank you all, man. We love you all. Spread the message. Share this video with, with your friends and your family. And let's go. Let's get it. I am a reparationist. I am a reparationist. Let me close out with the show's motto. Don't just fight the power. Become the power. And then and only then will you have the power to make a change. And with that, I say peace. Peace.